Okay, I'd like you to open up with me to the book of the Revelation, chapter 22. And we're going to be beginning on verse 6. When Abraham Lincoln was the President of the United States, he was attending a church service in New York City at a Presbyterian church, and at the end of the service, his friend who had brought him there said to him, wasn't that a great message? And he said, no. And his friend said, well, what do you mean? I thought it was a great message. And he said, there was something missing. What was that? Said his friend. And he said, the thing that was missing is there was no challenge. You ever hear a great message given without a challenge? When we come to the end of the book of the Revelation now, it, it, it ends with a challenge. If we looked at the last couple of weeks, we saw that, that God will create a new heavens and a new earth. And then he will create what is called, or he is creating, the new Jerusalem, which will come down from heaven, which will be the heavenly city, the capital of the new heavens and the new earth. And that is where believers will spend eternity from the Old and New Testament. Well, when we come to chapter 22, beginning in verse 6, we see that now God challenges those future citizens of the New Jerusalem, us. And God gives us a very strong challenge in his word here, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 6. It, it is a challenge of responsibility. You know, today in the culture we live in, people do not like to take responsibility. Have you noticed that? Man, if you're in a position of leadership, you know this is true. I don't, I don't care if you're leading a little league program in the local town. I mean, everywhere you go, from, you know, from the church, you know, you, it's organizations, it's in the business culture, people do not want to take responsibility you know, for their lives. And it's just so much easier to play the blame game you know, it, it's so much easier just to justify our, our situations and our failures or, or to just simply come up with excuses. Well, God challenges us to take responsibility and be responsible to Him for the things that, that He has given us. So, beginning on verse 6 of chapter 22, Then He had said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent His angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust. Still, he who is uh, filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous. Still, he who is holy, let him be holy. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city, but outside are dogs and sorcerers, and sexually immoral, and murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things. In the church, I am the root of the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears come. And let him who thirsts come. And whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from these words of the book, of the prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in the book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Would you just bow your heads for a moment? Father, open up our hearts to your word. For Lord, we do confess to you 
that your word, Lord God, needs to be understood spiritually. And without your spirit, without your anointing, Holy Spirit, we cannot grasp on to the things. They will go in one ear and go out the other, Lord God. We'll walk away without grasping on to one single thing in your word. So, Father, illuminate our minds through the spirit. We humble ourselves and we confess to you, Lord God, that we need you to teach us. And Lord God, let your word sink into our hearts and let it produce forth, Lord God, 30, 60, 100 times what is sown today. For your glory and for your honor, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So again, the title of the message is The Final Challenge. And we have the final challenge of the book of the Revelation. Again, what we looked at, we saw that God in chapter 21 creates the new Jerusalem. We also looked and we saw that we looked at the citizens of the new Jerusalem. And now again we come to a challenge to these future citizens of the new Jerusalem. And this morning what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at two things. Next week I'm going to look at two more. And then we're going to wrap up the book of the Revelation next Sunday. And I'm going to get into a series uh, over the course of um, the Christmas holidays called The Miracles of Christmas. And there are many miracles of Christmas. And there are things that we can be taking into our life. And we can experience the blessing of those miracles. And then come in January, I'm going to start on the Gospel of John. And just as we've gone through the book of the Revelation, I'm going to take you through, verse by verse, the Gospel of John. The universal Gospel. For all people, Greeks, and for Romans, and for Jews, and for men and women of all ages. And we're going to study the book of John as we go through next year. So, what I'd like to look at first here, responsibility again, of keeping the word. And what you have here is, and it's really a, a beautiful passage, you have the living word, Jesus Christ. And here he is magnifying the written word. And he is challenging us to, to be a people who build our lives upon the written word of God. Now I want you to, to look, I'm going to break this down here, and I'm going to look at, at five things. Responsibility of keeping the word. The first thing I want you to look at is the faithfulness of the word. Look at verse 26. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. I want you to look at the words faithful and true. Do you understand what the word of God is saying there? Jesus here is saying that his word is faithful and true. That you can count on his word. That you can build your life uh, upon his word. That, that his word okay, can, can be trusted. You know, we, we live in a world where you know, it, it, it's hard to trust anybody's word. I mean, you, you, you look at, at, at people, I mean, whether they are political leaders or business leaders, you look at religious leaders, I mean, you know, who can you trust? Well, Jesus is saying here that, that my word is faithful, my word is true. Now, some of you who, who are new to the word of God, you may be sitting there and go, well, how, you know, how can I, you know, trust? What makes, what makes this book any different than, you know, any other book? What makes it different than the Koran? Or what makes it different than the Eightfold Path of Buddha? What makes it different than the writings of, of Socrates or, or Seneca or, or any other philosopher? What makes it different? How can we know that this is the Word of God? I want to give to you just one key thing here. And there are many. You can, you can look at, at things like harmony, and if you've ever heard the argument, people will say, well, you know, what, how can you believe in that book? You know, that, that book. Well, actually, it's really not a book. It's 66 books written over the course of 1,500 years by 39 different authors. And there is a harmony and a flow through that. And the authors, many of them did not know each other. They were writing over the course of, of a, you know, a thousand-year span. Yet you see a continuous theme, and the book reads like uh, there's one author. So though John may have written, or Peter, or Moses, or Samuel, or Joshua, or Isaiah, or Ezekiel, there's a, there's a flow there. And that's a strong argument for, the, again, the divine inspiration, but I believe there are others. In fact, we're going to do, as we look, starting in a couple weeks, at the miracles of Christmas, we're going to look at some of the miracles that are revealed in the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, I'm going to show you some things that really that, that will put you in a place where you cannot deny that there is some type of supernatural origin in the scriptures. And we will look at things from a mathematical standpoint. 
So there, there's the harmony, there's, there's mathematical evidence, there's archaeological evidence, but the greatest evidence for the authenticity of the scriptures is prophecy. It's prophecy. And in fact, the, the passage, if you look at, at verse 6, it, it's basically saying that just as the Jews accepted the Old Testament as, as prophecy, the writings of, of Isaiah or the writings of Micah, the writings of Ezekiel, they accepted that as prophecy, as holy writ. They call it scripture. The, the, the word scripture means holy writings. And the Jewish people, when they called the Bible scripture, scripture they were referring to it as, as God revealed to the writers in a very unique, inspirational way, his word, and then they wrote it down without error. That is, that is Holy Scripture. Well, here in this verse, the book of the Revelation is being connected and being presented here as being Scripture. That it is inspired. That it is the inerrant Word of God. Without error, the Word of God. Just, just as you have, okay, in the Old Testament. But again, you may be sitting there and saying, okay, great. Well, it, it, so, so it's saying that it's the Word of God. And if I stand in front of you and I say I'm a watermelon, does that make me a watermelon? You may be saying, my head looks like a watermelon. And you're saying, there goes that egg head again. But no, 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 outside of that, okay, just because somebody says there's something or something says that it's something, does that make it something? And again, we, we come back to this concept of prophecy. There are 8,000, over 8,000 verses, okay, and you have about 32,000 verses in the Bible. 8,000 of them are devoted to prophecy, to predictions of things that are said would happen. There are over 900 prophecies in the entire Bible. 900 of them. And when you begin to look at, at, at prophecy, okay, we, we begin now to, to have an acid test. If the Bible predicts something and it's not true or it doesn't come true, then we would say that the Bible is false. In fact, the Bible actually gives us that as a criteria to testing different predictions that people make. In Deuteronomy 18, God spoke to Moses and said, if a prophet comes along and predicts something that doesn't come true, they're a false prophet. You know what he said to do to them? Again, in the Old Covenant, they would keep, the, keep, the, keep the population pure, take them out and stone them. If a, if, if a prophet comes... Now, we're living in a different economy right now. We're living in a different time. That was, that was specific to the Jewish people at a specific time. Jesus doesn't want us going around stoning people. Okay? He said, love your enemy. Okay? Love them. You know? Do good to them. Pray for them. But, but what do you do with people who come along and make all kinds of predictions that don't come true? So Nostradamus. I've, I've studied the quatrains of Nostradamus. In fact, I was studying the quatrains of Nostradamus before I ever studied the prophecies of the Bible, and I found that there were just, just many cockamamie predictions. I mean, people take them and twist them, but, but they're just cockamamie predictions that never came true. And the, the Bible says that if a person makes a prediction that doesn't come true, they're a false prophet. If you remember Gene Dixon, in 1958, and Gene Dixon predicted many, many things that never came true. You know what she became famous for? She predicted that J.F. Kennedy would be killed. Probably in that same year, she, she made a few predictions that came true, and there were about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them that didn't come true. But she predicted that in 1958, China would nuke the United States and annihilate us and take over the world, and that didn't happen. So the scriptures, again, says that she's a false prophet. Carol Camping. I was amazed at how, how many people were, they were, I mean, that, that night we went out to dinner and we, when we were talking with people who wouldn't go out to dinner that night, who were staying home, who brought the kids in the house, who were huddling together, waiting for the end of the world. We even had a, a friend of mine here, very, very successful and wealthy guy in the next town, very successful guy, multi, multi-millionaire, who was terrified that it, the end of the world was coming. He was studying with Harold Camping. Well, you know what? He predicted it, what, three times? And it didn't happen. I would say that the Bible makes it pretty clear. He's a false prophet. And then you have the, the Mayan prediction, which is December 21st, which is my birthday. <laughs> so I'm having a big party on the 20th. Everyone's invited. And uh, so that the next day when we're, when we're all in night, no, there's another prediction. And you see people, they're, they're walking around. People are really shaken up by this. You know, it's amazing. You know, I, I, it, it used to be that you'd find these programs on these things on National Geographic or Discover. 
Now, now they're on ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, CNN. I mean, it, just the other night we were sitting at home. There was one running on, on, on CNBC and there was another one running on Fox about, you know, they just people are, are preparing for the end of the world with the, the, the Mayan calendar, December 21st. I'll be here on December 22nd, I assure you, okay? I'll be here on December 22nd. You know, you know why? Because I, I know what the, the scriptures teach. Now, now, you may be sitting there and going, well, well what prophecies? What prophecies are there? And look, there, there are over 900 of them. But just, to, just to take the question that people ask me, what do you think is the greatest modern-day prophecy that has been predicted? Israel. I just want to just say Israel. And, and the, the Bible predicted that the Jewish people would come from the north, south, east, and west in the end times and be regathered in Israel. By the way, the Jewish people were dispersed throughout the world, what's called the Diaspora, in 70 AD. The Roman legions entered into Jerusalem. They crucified and killed 1.1 million Jews, and they were dispersed throughout the world. They leveled the city, just as Jesus predicted, fulfillment of another uh, prophecy. The temple would be totally laid to the ground, bare, you know, destroyed. And, and the Jews were dispersed. And from that time on, the Jews were dispersed throughout the world. And wherever you go, you find Jews, right? Anywhere. There's Jews, I mean, everywhere. There's, there's Jews in Russia, there's Jews in South America, Jews in America, there, there, there's, there's Jews in Africa, there's Jews in Australia, it, it, Jews in Indonesia, Jews in China. They're all over the world. Well, the Bible predicted that in the last days, the Jewish people would be regathered. And in 1948... A miracle happened. Over the course of 1870 years, the Jewish people were, were dispersed without a land, without a nation, without a city. And in 1948, the Jewish people, after the Holocaust, and over six million of them were slaughtered, the Jewish people are regathered, just as the scriptures said. And Ezekiel talked about that valley of dry bones, these bones, you know, we sing that song, these bones, these bones, these dry bones, you know what it talks about? That's from the book of Ezekiel, that these bones would come to life, and did you ever see pictures of the Jewish people who survived Auschwitz or Birkenbau? How, did you ever see those? They, they were like skeletons, and God put meat on their bones, and Israel was reborn in 1948. And the Jewish people ha had begun to come down from the north and from the south and from the east and from the west. Predictions that they would come from Ethiopia. You go to Israel and you see, you see African Jews. Dark-skinned Jews. And they came from Russia. And the scripture said they would come in mass from Russia. And it's believed there are about 3 million Jews now in Israel who came down from Russia. Escaped the persecution of communism that they would be regathered and that Jerusalem would become a Jewish city, which happened in 1967 after the Six-Day War. For the first time, again, in, in 1900 years, Jerusalem was in the hands of the Jewish people. And that the Hebrew language, which was lost, the Hebrew language of the Tanakh was lost. And there has never been a lost language that was regained. But miraculously, just as the scripture said, the Hebrew language would be, again, resurrected as it was in the time of Jesus and before in the time of the prophets. And the scripture says that all of this would be happening in the midst of war, in the midst of battle. You know, and people say, well, look, Israel was about to go to war with, 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 with the, you know, the, the Palestinians. Israel has been at war since 1958. There has been a continuous declaration against Israel of war. And 400 missiles... Came, came crashing through. And you know what the scripture says? That in the midst of all this, there will be surrounding nations that will be at war with Israel, but God will be delivering them divinely. 400 missiles came raging into Israel. Now either they're really bad shots, or God is doing something very miraculous. And I know you're going to sit there and say, well, they have that, that missile defense system. It only took out about 30% that came in. You know how many people died? 400 missiles. And there were five deaths. I know a lot of people say, well, you know, you see, if, if America, if America doesn't come to the aid of Israel, they're going to get destroyed. You know what? That's nonsense. You think God needs America? 
You think God needs our, 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 our politicians and, and our weapons to, to defend Israel? The hand of God is upon Israel. He's got a purpose for Israel. And that purpose will be fulfilled. And you see, you pick up the newspaper, you, you, you watch you know, Fox or CNN, and you can see the scripture being fulfilled before your eyes. That is, I believe, the greatest modern day prophecy that has been fulfilled. And that's just one. It, it's, it's, it's one of 900. So how can we know, how can we trust that the word of God is faithful and true as you begin to study and you begin to understand the prophecies of Scripture? Now I want you to, to just notice here. Notice it says, Then he said to me, verse 6, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Just notice this again. Who does God reveal his prophecy to? To his servants. To, you know, to, to the people, a, a servant of God is somebody who has come into relationship with Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You're, folks, if you have a hard time understanding the scriptures, you need to know the author. If you have a hard time understanding, the Bible makes this very clear that the Bible is decoded. And if you want to understand the scriptures, you need to get the code. And, and the way you get the code is by opening your heart to Jesus Christ and having his spirit come inside of you and what's called regenerate you, give you life, and illuminate you and give you an anointing. And the scriptures teach that <clears throat> the Holy Spirit's anointing will teach you, that, that he will <clears throat> instruct you. Have you ever tried sharing the word with somebody who is a non-believer and they cannot get it? Because, because the, the person without the Spirit cannot understand things that are discerned by the Spirit. The servants of God are the ones who will understand these, these revelations of God. And then notice, it says what shortly will take place. And, and people looked at it and say, well, it's been 2,000 years and it hasn't happened. Actually, it, it, was, it was shortly after the revelation that John received. Hey, we, we see that in fact, John was right in the midst of Revelation chapter 2, and right now in the time we live in, we're living in that period of Revelation 2 and 3, the church age. And you look at Revelation 2 and 3, you, you have a historical perspective, a, really a, and, and, and it's sequential, it, 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 it flows. As you go from one church to the other, you see the different churches in different periods of church history, given 2,000 years from the time that we're living in ending with the church of Laodicea, which I believe is the modern day church in the time that we live in. A church that is kind of obsessed with material things, was obsessed with just, you know, just, just current, you know, current things, and they want the blessing now, and it's a church that's lukewarm, and Jesus says, you, you think you're alive, but you're dead. You know, he, says, he says, you know, you're, you're, you're lukewarm, you're not hot, you're not cold, I want to spit you out of my mouth. That, that to me describes the, you know, the, the, the church today. Talk to most Christians. You know what they're, they're all they're interested in is, is getting stuff. God's a magic genie. Don and I were just talking about this. A, a TV preacher who was signing books uh, locally here a couple of a couple of days ago. Just just all he does is he preaches this this ridiculous message that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a false prophet, and it's it's all about you just you 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 getting. And you look at the message of Jesus, and it's about humbling yourself and becoming his, his servant. And giving your life to him as your Lord. And devoting your life to building his kingdom, not your own. The message today is all about you getting what you want from the magic genie in heaven. And boy, a lot of people are going to be surprised when they meet him and realize he wasn't a magic genie. Boy, a lot of people are going to be surprised. So, so here, again, the, the word of God can be trusted because, again, God confirms it in a number of ways, prophecy being the major way, and it is there for the servants of God to be able to grasp it and understand it. Now, the second thing I want you to look at, the blessing of the word. Look at verse 7. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And I want you to look at the word quickly. Because, again, people say, well, he said he was going to come quickly, and it's 2,000 years, and he hasn't come yet. But the, the word quickly, it occurs, in fact, here in verse 7, verse 12, and verse 20. 
And it's not referring, you know, when we think quickly, we think days or hours or, you know, or weeks. But the, the idea here is once it begins to happen, it's going to happen speedily. It's talking about once Jesus, you know, once this, this, prophetic, this prophetic scenario begins to play out, it's going to happen rapidly. It's going it's to happen very quickly. It's going to be rapid succession. Think about this. The church age, okay, we're at 2,000 years right now. The book of the Revelation, when you get to chapter 6, you have the beginning of the tribulation. From chapter 6 to chapter 19, the tribulation occurs. How many years is the tribulation? Seven years. Think about it. Chapters 2 and 3 take thousands of years to fulfill. But once this, the prophetic scenario begins to play out, Jesus comes and raptures his church, then it's like rapid succession. You have, you have the, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, and the Lord returns. And I believe that's what the reference here is to, to quickly that there will be this rapid succession of things that happen. Now notice the blessing. And we have here the sixth blessing, okay, in, in, in the Word. The book of the Revelation has six bless, uh, seven blessings. This is the sixth. And notice, who is the blessing for? Those who what? Who keep the Word. A blessing upon us. That God, God promises this supernatural blessing upon those who keep the word. And we immediately think of, of okay, that means if I obey the word, I'm going to have this, this blessing upon me. And that's true. In fact, I'll say this to you. Obedience to the word will bring security into your life. Just, you, you, there's certain laws and principles. If you violate them, even the laws of the, of the town, of the, of the state, of the government, if you, if you go out and you decide that, hey, you know what, think of it like this. Think of the lights coming here to church. And when you come to a red light, what does that mean you should do? Good. Because when I'm driving around, there are a lot of people who don't realize that. And when you come to a green light, what should you do? Go. And yellow light, you should be... You know, that. Well, you're, the, you're what I'm talking about. So when you, when you come to the red, you stop. Now think of this. What if you decide, hey, you know what? You're going to stop on green. What's going to happen to you? It's not going to be too long before somebody piles into you. Okay, hopefully you just get into a minor accident. Let's say when you go, come to the red light, you decide to go. What's going to happen to you? I guarantee you ain't going to get home today before you're in a serious accident. You're doing it during a weekday before a trailer truck comes ripping through that light and it kills you. But think of people who just continuously violate the laws. Now, there, there are earthly laws, laws made by men to protect us in our culture and in our society, and then there are heavenly laws. And you look at people who violate those... I mean, folks, you ever see people... I mean, just, it's just... Their life is a mess. They're a physical mess. They're, they're, they're a psychological mess. An emotional mess. Their marriage is a mess. Their, their family is a mess. Why? They just continue to violate the principles and laws of God. And coming into obedience to the Word of God, it, it brings us into a place of security and a blessing. Amen. Let me just stress this to you. The concept here again about keeping the Word, it, it's being obedient to the Word, it's also guarding the Word. We have a responsibility to guard the Word, to stand up for the Word, to defend the Word. You ever get scoffers, they come and they, they mock, they, they, they mock the, the Bible? How could, you, how could you believe in that? How could you believe in that book? That book was just written by men. And how many times I'm defending the Word of God to people and taking them through the prophecies and showing them the odds of prophecy that when you take one prophecy and then there's another prophecy and another prophecy, you end up with, with odds that are like, like a trillion to one that the Word of God is true. Taking them through the mathematical probability Mathematics is a science you can't argue with. You can't manipulate it. And you take them through the mathematical probability of the scriptures. All the, all the different... Hey, here's, here's one. And people say, well, how could you trust the Bible? You know, when, when, when people were writing it, there's errors, you know, and they, and they made out. Do you ever understand how the scribes transcribed the Bible one book after another? The book of Isaiah. There was a, a manuscript of Isaiah found from about 200 B.C., 
And then they found another one that was uh, transcribed basically 200 years later, about the time of Jesus. And when they compared the two, they did find an error. There was a, a, a comma that was supposed to go from right to left, and it went from left to right. The scribe made a mistake. Now, do you know how they would, how they would do this? The scribe would sit down, and he would, he would copy the copy that they had, the original copy, okay, that they have of the book of Isaiah. He would sit down, and he would copy it. Now, standing over him were his supervisors, okay? These are the, the upline scribes, for those of you who are in network marketing, okay? And they were looking over their shoulder. Now, if that scribe made an error, imagine transcribing the book of Isaiah. You come to chapter 66 and the last verse, and you misspell a letter. They'd rip it up, burn it, and you'd have to start over again. This, this is how the Bible has been passed through the centuries. And again, most people will sit there and say, well, you know what, they, they just passed it on in words, and, and, and you know, there were errors. No, that's not the way. This, this was a science. And God did this, I believe, to protect the authenticity of the scriptures by the scribes. But essentially, the word of God, we are to defend the word of God. We are to obey it, but we are to stand up for it, just as we stand up for Jesus. We are to, to be defenders of the word. That's what the scripture verse is saying, and that brings tremendous blessing. Look at number three. The worship of the God of the word. Now look at verse eight. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. John, what are you doing? Don't you think John should have known better? The author of the Gospel of John? He who is the one who said seven times, I'm the one that Jesus loves? He's the one who put his head upon the bosom of the Lord at the Last Supper? He's the one who wrote, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God? Described him as the light of the world, the salt of the earth, the bread of life, the resurrection and the life, the true vine. And he falls down before this angel. And notice what the angel said in verse 9. And then he said to me, see that you do not do that. This is a strong rebuke. See that you don't do that. For I am your fellow servant. And of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God, he says. You know, this angel is appalled. I want to tell you why I believe he's appalled. Be because from the creation that he came from, uh, one who was like him, named Lucifer, he, he got caught up in the beauty that, that God had, had created in him, and he started wanting the creation to worship him. And, and it caused him to lose his place and be cast out. And he led one third of the angels with him. You can read about that in Ezekiel 28. You can read about that in Isaiah chapter 14. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 12. So this angel realizes, hey, I don't want to be caught up with this. Don't worship me. Worship God. And he's a great and important word for us all. Hey, the worship of anyone but God is idolatry and blasphemy. The, the worship of Mary, of an apostle, of an angel, of any other man, or a Nephilim. If you don't know what Nephilim are, you've got to read Genesis chapter 4 and 5. The, the worship of any of these other things is blasphemy and idolatry to God. We're not to worship mankind. We're not to worship creation. We're to worship the living God. Notice, notice what he says here. He says here, of those who keep the words of the book. Notice, I just want you to see this. See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. You know, Satan was a believer. You all know that, right? You ever see people say, oh yeah, yeah, I believe in God. Satan believes in God. Satan believed in Jesus. He believes in Jesus. He believes that Jesus is the, the Lord and, and, and the Savior of, of mankind. He believed that Jesus did miracles. He believed in the miracles. He believed Jesus was raised from the dead. Was he a believer? No, no, he's not a believer. Because when you, when you understand what a believer is, and it's you, that's a, see, 
what, what a lot of people think today is, oh, I'm a Christian, I believe. Yeah, I believe, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I believe you are raised from the dead. Yeah, I believe, I believe in all that, but all it is is mental assent. And that is not what the word believes. The scriptural word for belief is pistos. And pistos was a word that, that said, it was an embracing of the truth that brought change, radical change. Don't you notice when you read the Gospels that the calling of Jesus upon people's lives and those who truly followed him, it was radical and it was radically different? I mean, I, I noticed this. Look, I was an atheist. I, had, I didn't want anything to do with Christianity. I saw, I saw so much hypocrisy in Christianity. I wanted nothing. Then I became a Christian. I saw more hypocrisy in Christianity. But, but when, when I became a Christian, one thing that hit me as I began to read the Gospels, and this is what captured me, because I didn't see this in people's lives who claimed to be Christian around me. You know, people who claimed to be Christian and, and, and there was nothing Christian about them. Where, where was the radical transformation? Where was the change? Where was the, the servant's heart? Where was the lordship of Christ? Where was discipleship? And, and when I began to study the Gospels, I began to see Jesus called people to a radical faith. It wasn't, it wasn't easy beliefism. It was, it was a radical change, a radical embrace of Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Satan, Satan believes. Satan believes again in God. He believes in Jesus. He believes in the miracle. believes in the resurrection. But he's, he's not a true believer. A true believer, they, they believe that Jesus is God and they surrender to him as God. They believe that Jesus is Lord and they commit their life to following him as their Lord. They believe that Jesus is their Savior and they humbly submit themselves to him as their Savior. The worship of God in the Word, of the Word. The fourth thing I want you to look at, the relevance of the Word, verse 10 and 11. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And notice again, I, I use this term, the relevance, because this is a book that is relevant to our time. Don't seal it up. You know, God told Daniel to seal up the prophecy in the book of Daniel, chapter 12. Why? Why is Daniel told to seal the prophecy in Daniel chapter 12, but here John is told not to seal the prophecy? I'll tell you, because Jesus hadn't come. He hadn't been crucified. He hadn't been raised from the dead. We, we live in, a, in an economy, we live in a time that is extremely relevant. I believe we live in a time right now that is, that is, that is key. It, it, is, it is this time, not meaning this day or this hour, but this time. It, it, it is now the time for God's people to understand his word and to understand the futuristic things that God is explaining. Hey, think of this. How many, how many people do you meet again who are freaking out about um, December 21st? How many people do you see who, you know, they're, I mean, people coming up to me all the time, hey, that hurricane, you know, hey, what's going on in this world? You know, it seems like we're, 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 something's going on. There's something, there's something that, that's happening in the entire world. Hey, I heard that the Bible said this or that, and they're freaking out. You know, we're not to be freaking out. We're to understand the futuristic things. We're not, we're not to be living in, in, in fear. We're, we're to be in a place where, where God has revealed to us very clearly his timetable and to how things will be happening. People come to well, December 21st is going to be the end of, going to be, going to be the, end of the world. It's going to be the end of the world. Hey, man, I, I know what the word of God says. No. But I know this. You better be ready because Jesus can come back at any time. And I think that he said, he said you won't know the day or the hour, but he did say, you will know the signs of the times. And when you look at the signs that we're living in, I, I would say that, hey, you know what? A lot of those signs are being fulfilled. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Red sky in the morning, sailor's warning. Jesus said something like that in Matthew 17. And he said that the scribes and Pharisees, they could interpret the sky, but they couldn't interpret the signs of the times. Through the, through the power of the Spirit, we can interpret the signs of the times. And then I want you to notice the last thing here, the fifth, the warning of the word, verse 18 through 19. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away 
from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things uh, which are written in the book. And you know what you have here? A very simple test. A test of uh, addition and a test of subtraction. Anybody who adds to the book. You ever see, you ever see people, the Bible's not enough? You've got to have their additional book along with it. Mormonism. You need another book. You need the Book of, the book of Mormon. Christian Science. You need, you need Mary Baker Eddy's book to go along with it. Islam. The Bible's not enough. You have to have the Koran. You'll find, you find the same thing in, in Unity. You'll find the 17, in Seventh-day Adventism. It's not enough. You have to have these additional books. This is what I think the Word of God was talking about. This book is sufficient. And we are, we are not to be, to be adding to it. Nor are we to be subtracting from it. The churches that, that will say, oh, you know what, well, well, this doesn't apply for today. No, the virgin birth, that, that, the virgin birth that's, that's, not, that's not what it's saying. Or Jesus did not rise from the dead bodily. Jesus is not God. And they just start taking away the subtraction and the addition of the Word of God. But we have a, a calling to be responsible to the Word. To obey it, to defend it, and to guard it. Now, I want to say one more thing to you, and it's going to be brief. The responsibility of serving God. Look at verse 12 through 14. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. People say, well, I thought we were saved by grace, not by works. Yeah, we're saved by grace. But you are going to be rewarded in the next life for what you did with the time you've had as a Christian, from the day you accepted Christ till the day you die, God is going to hold you responsible for what you did with your life. I, I want to show you a, a passage here. If you, could, uh, if you could see that or you can look at it in your Bibles. It's not coming up as clear as I'd like. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 12 through 15, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, it's talking about the foundation being Christ. Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, now notice this, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Do you want to see the picture here? That we're going to get to heaven... And again, we are saved by grace. But there are going to be brothers and sisters who get to heaven who did nothing for God. They, 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 did not, they did not serve Him. They did not use their gifts, their talents, and their abilities for the building of the kingdom. But they truly put their faith and embraced Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That those people are going to come into heaven and we're going to say... I smell, I smell something. Something's burning. And you know what it's going to be? It's going to be the seat of their pants. That they're going to be in heaven, but you know what? They got through barely and they're still singed. That's what the passage is saying. That there are people who wasted their Christian life. And you know, you look at your life and you look at, hey, what is going to be able to survive through fire? And you can, look, you can look at your careers and your trophies. You can look at your IRAs and your bank accounts. You can look at all those things. And let me tell you something. The things that will go with us into the next life are the things we have done for Christ. I, I, you know, I put in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. That's an, a, an awards ceremony. But we will be awarded. Let me just... I want to give you this. Story of the church. This is the story of the church. And I've seen this played many times. I've, I've seen it played here with some people, but I've sadly seen it played in other churches throughout our area and throughout the country. There's a family or a person. They occasionally attend. They occasionally attend. They never give anything. They never do anything. They never volunteer or serve doing anything. They come late. 
they leave early, or they usually complain a lot, and they'll complain about the music, and that the preaching is too long, and programs, and they're spectators. And not only are they spectators, but they're critical spectators. And they're consumers. And one day, they come to church. And the doors are closed. And there's no pastor there to preach. There's, there's no worship leader or worship team to, to lead in worship. The grass has grown really long on the outside of the church. Nobody's cut it. The paint is peeling off the, uh, the, church, uh, you know, the church building. The doors are shut. Windows are cracked. And they stand there and say, oh, how terrible. Our church has gone out of business. Do you know about this family? Or this person? Oh, we see them all the time. You know what we call them? They're church killers. They're, they're, they, they are church killers. And if you get enough of them in a church, they will kill your church. I, I've, I've worked with other pastors, and I'll tell you, I, I've seen many times when, when they've shared with me the commitment of their people, and I said, your, your church is on the verge of dying. Your church, your church is not going to survive. Listen, Jesus didn't call us to be spectators. He called us to be servants. He didn't call us to be getters. That's the world. Spectators are of the world. Getters are of the world. He called us to be givers. He didn't call us to be watchers, but to be worshipers. You know, great churches are not churches that have lots of people. Great churches are churches that are made up of faithful people. He didn't call us to sit on our butts. You know what I'm talking about, your butts? Some of you have some really big butts, and I'm not talking about you physically. The butts I'm talking about is, oh, uh, but, but I had to work today. But, I, but you see, I, 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 don't, I don't have time to, to, to serve, but I'm, I'm too tired, uh, but I'm, I'm too young, but I'm, I'm, I'm too old, but, but I, you know what I'm talking about, butts, church killers. He called us to be servants who serve the Alpha and the Omega. Look at the passage. The beginning and the end. That's God Almighty, the Creator, the Sustainer, the Lord, and our Savior. Why do you serve Him? Why would you want to serve Him? And some people, again, they serve him to get. That's not a good reason to serve him. Some people serve him out of grim duty. We don't need those kind of servants. Paul said, the love of Christ compels me. The love of Christ compels me. The love of Christ compels me. For he died for all. And therefore I lay down my life for the one who died for me. The, the only reason to, to serve him is because he hung there six hours one Friday taking all your filth, all your sins, all your evil upon himself so that you could stand before God as an innocent child and God can see you as though you've never sinned. That's the reason to serve him. Hallelujah. The final word. Two little lines. I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one, soon will its fleeing hours be done, then in that day my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life, will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life that still the small voice gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a brief few years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears. Each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep, in joy or sorrow the words to keep. Faithful and true, whatever the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life 
will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn, and from the world now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, twas worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That will be a reality in each and every one of our lives very soon. Let it be a reality of joy and of splendor because the life we lived, we live for Christ. Amen? Let's bow our heads and close.